Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are around the world. Welcome to this FIDIC webinar. I'm really is looking at our new contract document, the Green Book. Uh, my name is Dr. Nelson ogun -Shake. I'm the CEO of FIDIC. Uh, based in Geneva. I'm delighted really to welcome you all and particularly welcome to those who are following us on YouTube uh, for being able to join us in this particular topic, which is quite critical for our industry. Uh, I'm pleased that we have a, a fantastic number of uh, a speaker who is going to help us to have the discussion. Uh, without further ado, just to give you a headline of where we've been, uh, the FIDIC has been very busy over the last 18 months. We've held close to 45 or past 45 uh, webinar uh, with quite uh, a number of registered, uh, over 35,000 people registered around the world. And we've had close to 29,000 plus more uh, who's actually been involved you know, in joining us from 150 countries around the world. I do believe that in addition to those who are participating, we've had close to 34,000 people watching our program on YouTube. So for those who are on YouTube live now, welcome. And for those who are joining us on the mainstream, welcome. Uh, just looking forward, uh, the FIDIC program for this year uh, is covered into two parts. One is the FIDIC committee webinar, of which this particular one is specially brought to you by our contract committee. We do have our state of the world you know, webinar, which we produce, and there will be one coming through. And there's the ongoing you know, FIDIC COVID webinar series, which is something that we always like to make sure members and the stakeholders in the industry are involved in joining us. Uh, today, I understand that we have quite a lot of people registered from different parts of the world. Uh, before we kickstart the conversation, I believe that you know, there's a, a soft question to get us started into the issue, which is the Green Book is suitable for use in the following subject. We are asked to make a vote. Is it useful in one particular or two or three or four? Are in simple works of value up to about 500,000? and six month duration, relatively simple or repetitive work. The amount of contrast sum should not be the governing factor. Simple and repetitive soil laying works or transmission or rural road work or any of the above. You are now asked to vote. This is really to help us uh, get started with the subject, which is critical. Uh, and I suspect the question for us really to dismiss it, Ms. Fry, the concern as to when do you use the Green Book and when don't you use the Green Book? Um, Barbara, do we have any feedback from the floor uh, in terms of the activity? I think I get 35% says number one, uh, and you got 20% say relatively simple, and 5% says simple, and you got 40% say any of the above. The correct answer, it is any of the above, uh, because you know the Green Book is actually quite useful for any of the project that's been specified in there, uh, which is quite encouraging. Uh, moving on forward, I do believe that we have quite a lot of people who join us from different parts of the world. Uh, you would have actually had us publishing some papers last year on the guidance memorandum for COVID-19. Uh, later on this afternoon or this morning or this evening, wherever you are, we will probably spotlight in the new publication which is coming up uh, with the support of our contract uh, com a committee chair, which is Vincent Lulu, we give you a very quick insight into where we are on this subject. So moving on swiftly uh, is actually looking through today's program. It is my pleasure once again to introduce our newly elected president, Anthony Barry from Australia, uh, to join us and share some thought of wisdom with us before we kickstart. So, Tony, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Nelson. I'm very, very pleased to be joining Nelson to welcome uh, our panelists, number one, and uh, our participants to the webinar in which we're looking to discuss the newest edition, if you like, of the uh, FIDIC contract suite, uh, the short form of contract, commonly known as the Green Book. Uh, this uh, is our second edition. As Nelson's already indicated, the COVID-19 uh, state of the world and the committee webinar programs have been very, very well attended and looking at the number of registrations tonight, we will assume much appreciated. Uh, the Secretariat team has done a tre tremendous job in arranging and organising the programs and I congratulate them. I think it has been a fantastic initiative over the last couple of years. Uh, I'd like to really uh, give a big vote of thanks to the Green Book Task Group led by Vincent Wulu. Uh, the various task members, our legal advisor, Chris Seppolo, our friendly reviewers, and many people who provided feedback after the soft launch of the uh, second edition of the Green Book late last year. 
I'd also like to extend my uh, thanks to my fellow board member, Sawano Hajmal Jardi and uh, CEO Nelson Hogan Shaken, our legal officer, Daduna Kokridzi, um, for their tremendous support. Bringing one of these contracts through to publication is a massive exercise. I'm personally, uh, I've witnessed the debates, the discussions and the robustness of that, the intellects that uh, are on our contracts committee and in our task groups. And I can assure you, they go through a tremendously uh, rigorous process to get to publication. So I congratulate everybody involved. The Green Book and the guidance material and the forms that are now embedded in it represent a significant addition to the FITIC contracts ecosystem. It's part of the very significant development program undertaken by the FITIC Contracts Committee. And as we continue to develop our new forms of contracts, our guides, our training material and our webinars, we are trying to support and achieve best in class international standard contracts. The contribution of FITIC contracts to the global construction industry is very significant and we should be very proud of it. I thank the members of the Contracts Committee again, that's task groups for the tremendous work they're doing and extend my appreciation or extend the appreciation of the whole FITIC family really for their work. Lastly, uh, I'd like to uh, extend my welcome again to our expert panelists. And I very much look forward to this discussion. So thank you, Nelson, and uh, let's, uh, let's proceed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tony. I'm really pleased that uh, leading towards your presidency, you had the mandate to make sure you stay the contract committee in the right path. So this is really one of your output as a, a president at like last year, moving swiftly into the president position. So I'm really delighted you're able to join us and hopefully we can retain your continued support you know, uh, over the next uh, few months because there is a lot coming through from contract committee. They are very, very busy and we need to maintain that momentum going forward. Um, without further ado, just to give you some statistics before I bring our key MC for the event. Uh, I believe that we do have uh, over 1,000 people register. I know I've been told that not to actually go too much into that. What I know for sure is that apart from people participating here, quite a lot of people will join us on YouTube, either immediately or during the particular event. So we really would like to welcome those people who are joining us on the YouTube. But I'm told also, in addition to the big registration, we have close to 100 people from United States, uh, about 80 people from United Kingdom, United Arab Emirates, about 70, and the list goes on. So we do have representation from different parts of the world. And we have client, government, a funder, and all key stakeholders involved with the whole process. So I'm really pleased wherever you are, where you, where you come from, from different parts of the industry, welcome to this particular conversation. So leading next to the uh, conversation, uh, it's really my great pleasure uh, to introduce our uh, you know, MC for the event. Well, it's not an MC, but he's actually going to moderate. So I'm gonna have a break, but before I do that, let me just give you some of his pedigree. Uh, whose name, Maddie, he is the vice chair of the FIDIC contract committee. He was the chair of the FIDIC task group 15 and 15B, uh, and he's FIDIC international accredited trainer and an affiliate member of FIDIC adjudicator and arbitrator and founder of his company, Shura Constructive Management. Uh, whose name, I don't need to say any more than that. The floor is yours and take over, and I'm going to chill out and just listen to the conversation. Whose name, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Nelson, for the, this uh, kind introduction. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome uh, to the webinar. Uh, good evening, good afternoon, and uh, good morning, wherever you are in the world. Uh, before I move on to the speakers, uh, I just need to highlight some uh, housekeeping matters. Uh, at certain points, uh, you will hear me making a sound of a beep. Don't get alarmed. This is just a heads up for the speaker that they have two minutes remaining out of their time and they need to wrap up uh, uh, their speak. Uh, another thing, please, we will have a Q&A session of at least 20 minutes after the presentations by the speakers. So if you have any question, just prepare them or provide them in the chat box. Ideally, if you want a question addressed to a certain speaker, please say so next to uh, uh, the question. 
Uh, next slide, please. Uh, let's move on to uh, our lineup of uh, uh, speakers, uh, in very interesting speakers. And uh, we have the first speaker, speaker which is uh, Vincent Leloup. Uh, Vincent is our uh, chairman for the contracts committee. Uh, he is also a FIDIC accredited trainer and adjudicator in the French national list of FIDIC adjudicators and an arbitrator with an FCIR accreditation. He's a civil engineer with a master's in water management, a master's in agronomy uh, uh, from Ingenierie uh, or ENGREF from France with legal qualifications, master's in construction law and dispute resolution from the King's College uh, in the UK. Uh, he has 25 years of experience on international construction operations, uh, including building and infrastructure projects in more than 40 countries. Uh, he worked uh, for contractors uh, then uh, as a consulting engineer, so he has both backgrounds. Uh, he is now acting as a solo practitioner since 2013 for training, consulting, and dispute resolution services towards the construction industry. He's the co-drafter of the FIDIC 2017 suite of uh, agreements, the consultancy agreements, and the principal drafter of the FIDIC 2021 Green Book. He is the founder and director of studies of the Postgraduate Diploma International Construction Contracts, IT, I2C, uh, at the Paris Pantheon Assas University. So we, our first speaker is the chairman of the Contracts Committee, chairman of TAS Group 15 in charge of, in charge of drafting the Green Book 2021 and the principal drafter of the Green Book 2021. So, so who's better than Vincent to talk about the Green Book? Without further ado, Vincent, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much, Fosni, and hello to everyone. Uh, I'm very glad to take you through this uh, presentation of the uh, objective uh, that we had in the task group drafting, uh, the update of the Green Book, the objective we followed for the drafting, and also I will give you an overview of the, uh, the main features of the, the Green Book, which you can expect to find in the publication, which will be made in December in conjunction with the uh, FIDIC International Contract Users Conference. Uh, so I'm very glad also to have uh, my colleague Mahmoud Hussein, uh, who is part of the, the task group, uh, who helped me to, uh, to draft this uh, new green book. I should also mention about Jim Perry and Robert Wirt, who are uh, also part of the task group. They are not speaking today, but they are part of the uh, audience. Um, so first of all, in terms of the general objective for the new uh, Green Book, what we wanted to do is to meet the current demand of the international construction industry uh, for projects where the perceived level of risk is low uh, and or where construction parties wish to use a form which is simple of use and does not require significant contract administration and management resources. Uh, we have seen over the last 22 years that uh, sometimes when we were giving some indications in terms of the capital value of the works uh, that could be contemplated by the Green Book, that our indicative values tended to be taken as a kind of firm value. So the, hence the question we had to you at the beginning of this uh, uh, webinar, uh, when we mentioned in the past that the Green Book could be used for works of less than $500,000 and less than six months, uh, this was, of course, not meant to be uh, limited to that, but we saw in practice that many users uh, uh, took that into account and thought that it would be a limitation. So with the new edition, we wanted not to reflect any capital value threshold anymore. Uh, we are well aware that uh, multilateral development banks, such as the World Bank, for example, uh, they have so-called standard bidding document for small works contract, and they set a threshold of $10 million. Uh, so of course, the Green Book is perfectly uh, fit for that particular purpose to be used for works of capital value threshold less than $10 million, but also for more. Uh, it's not uh, an absolute reference which is able to be taken into account. What counts is project context where you perceive the level of risk to be low and or where you don't want uh, to use the same extent of contract administration resources that would be required under other uh, forms of contract in our suite of contract, like the FIDIC Red Book, for example, 2017 edition, or the FIDIC Yellow Book, uh, 2017 edition also, or the Silver Book, uh, for example. 
Uh, so uh, in order to uh, achieve that objective, and let me also uh, uh, mention uh, an interesting data we collected uh, three years ago now, we carried out a market survey, and you would be surprised to hear that uh, uh, when we went to the market, we heard that uh, 18% of the reported uses of the Green Book were actually for projects of more than $10 million and more than two years of duration, time for completion. Uh, so we took all that into account when we drafted the update. And what we wanted to do is uh, threefolded. We wanted to capture the essential rights and obligations of the parties to provide an alternative to 2017 red and yellow book uh, contract for construction project where it's not deemed required to mobilize the same amount and extent of contract administration and management resources. And of course, we have made sure to comply with the philosophy and terminology where relevant uh, of uh, the uh, 2017 red and yellow book. So now let us go into the features that you can expect with the second edition of the Green Book. Uh, still the standard default scenario is uh, the scenario where the contractor executes the works in accordance with specification and drawings prepared by or on behalf of the employer. However, uh, we have catered for an alternative scenario where the contractor is required to design the works to various possible degrees. So there are contractors design provisions, and of course, those design provisions for the contractor come along with a fitness for purpose a warranty for any part of the works which is designed by the contractor. The guidance note also will provide for specific provisions to be added to the Green Book in case you want to have a full contractor's design scenario and not only a partial design. Um, an engineer is appointed by the employer to administer the contract for and on behalf of the employer is to, uh, uh, however, act fairly and neutrally when making determination and to act fairly when certifying payment. So we had an employer's representative in the Green Book. We have now an engineer. This is to reflect the fact that we are covering a much wider range of projects with the new Green Book. Uh, as a result, you will see that uh, the provisions have been strengthened, muscled up. Uh, so we have, yes, as a consequence, more text uh, in the new Green Book, uh, but more elaborate provisions so as to be able to cover a wider ground uh, of uh, projects. Uh, the contractor, as usual, uh, as with our other books, will have to comply with an instruction given by uh, the engineer. In terms of the pricing for the works, various methods of valuation are proposed uh, either um, lump, sum, lump sum prices, uh, remeasurement based on a bit of quantities, cost plus principles also, or a combination of those. Uh, the variations, as usual with our other books, can be carried out through, through, through sorry, two procedural paths. One, which is the express one, uh, which is a variation by instruction path with uh, an obligation to uh, immediately execute the variation instructed by the engineer. However, subject to certain limitations, which will give the contractor the right to object and not to be bound by a variation instruction. For example, the case of uh, a variation, which is unforeseeable in scope, unforeseeable capital U defined term, and uh, also the case where uh, the variation leads to health, safety, and environmental uh, uh, issues. And the second one is, of course, the traditional one, the stage one, by request for proposal uh, uh, of the contractor. We wanted to have also clarity in the sense that we have summarized all of the employer's risk into one single table. Those of you using Green Book, Blue Book, know that we have employer's risk, defined risk, liabilities summarized in one clause. We went a little bit further by uh, summarizing all of the employer's risk and also describing the entitlement going with each risk allocated to the employer in terms of extension of time, in terms of entitlement to cost plus profit, and also entitlement to prolongation cost. Prolongation cost is a new feature of our forms 
This is meant to liquidate rapidly, easily, uh, as for any liquidated damages, uh, the amount of prolongation costs which are payable by the employer to the contractor for a compensable uh, extension uh, of time. So it's the first time we introduce this in a FIDIC form, and we are eager to see the market uh, reaction in this respect uh, for this new feature with uh, uh, pro provisions which have been provided to reflect the fact that uh, uh, the works are delivered on a construction job, not in a linear manner, but more in a gauche curve type, so a bell curve, and so we have captured this in the formula. Depending on the time when a delay event occurs, this will generate, trigger different prolongation cost. Um, also, in terms of liquidated damages provisions, huh, not only pro prolongation costs, which is a uh, new feature, uh, we have the usual delay damages provision and also the usual termination provision. So again, for the sake of a green book, we took the view that uh, it's much better to provide to the party some quick fix remedies for delay, for termination, rather than them relying on expert evidence in a dispute resolution forum, for which the cost and time of doing so could be prohibitive and somehow uh, would not be uh, commensurate to the amount of capital value uh, that we are dealing with. So yes, it's going to be a quick fix remedy. It might be seen to be rough justice, uh, but what is gained uh, in terms of uh, uh, speed uh, is for the interest of uh, the project uh, as per our belief. Uh, you will have also uh, claim procedures with time limits set out but no time bar, reflecting the fact that we are not dealing with the same extent. We are not mobilizing in the Green Book the same extent of contract administration resources as in other books. Uh, for your dispute uh, resolution, but also dispute avoidance, we have a standing adjudicator to be mobilized from the outset of the contract implementation. Three options will be uh, at the disposal of the parties, either to keep the adjudicator in the background just, in, just until if and when there is a dispute uh, coming up. Uh, so in that case, you can uh, go to the adjudicator who has been appointed. That avoids the difficulty of having to mobilize and to agree on someone when a dispute occurs. He or she will be there in the background. Second option, you can ask the adjudicator also from time to time to give you some opinions which are not binding, so informal assistance. And finally, you could go also for the fully fledged approach of having the adjudicator coming on site regularly every three or four months to review project progress and assist the parties in preventing uh, issue that they may encounter from becoming claim or dispute. So basically, depending on the capital value of the works you are dealing with, you could find that, that option to be uh, interesting. Uh, we have expedited <laughs> procedure provisions. Yeah, sorry, could you wrap up? Because we, for time's sake, we need to move on to Mahmoud. Thank you so much. Sure. So we have expedited procedure provisions for the final tier of uh, dispute resolution with ICC uh, arbitration. Uh, we have also incorporated the usual provisions for work section, taking over certificate, DNP, performance certificate. You will find also an insurance table summarizing all insurance requirements. Certificate for insurance will be required from the parties. Uh, policies might be uh, disclosed if required, but the certificate would be the one to go for. And finally, you might be interested in also in looking at our forms for guidance. We have provided some 39 forms of communication for guidance purposes to uh, the users and many other things that we'll have the pleasure to disclose in December to you. Thank you very much and sorry for being a bit long on this. Uh, thank you, Vincent. Thank you so much for this uh, introduction of the Green Book. Now we move on to our uh, second uh, speaker, which he also has a hands-on experience with the uh, Green Book 2021, Mahmoud Abu Hussein. Mahmoud is a member of the FIDIC uh, Contracts Committee and also a member in Task Group 8 in charge of updating the Green Book. Uh, he is also a friendly reviewer of the, of the 2017 White Book and 2017 second editions uh, of the Red, Yellow and Silver. He's a qualified engineer with 30 years of experience in the fields of procurement and contracts, uh, design, coordination and construction management for large scale oil and gas, power generation and distribution, architectural and research projects. He worked uh, for main contractors executing design and build EPC and BOOT projects. 
consultants. Uh, he also works with consultants uh, advising governmental agencies and providing EPCM services for multi-prime power generation projects and also for employers and owners. He has a diverse career journey in Egypt, France, USA, and the Arabian Gulf with employers, including, uh, we don't want to name uh, uh, certain employers, uh, but he worked with really big names. So Mahmoud, um, have you ever used the Green Book uh, 1999 and how you find it in comparison with the 2021 Green Book to be released in December? The floor is all yours, Mahmoud. Thank you so much, uh, Hosni, for the, your kind uh, introduction. And thank you, Vincent. And uh, greetings to you all uh, from uh, sunny Abu Dhabi, uh, wherever you are, uh, and in particular to Robert and Jim. I'm glad uh, to hear from Vincent that they are part of the audience. We obviously wish they, uh, they were with us uh, today, but uh, there will be, of course, uh, other chances and opportunities in, in the future. Um, thank you so much again, Hosni, for uh, asking this question because uh, indeed my relationship with the Green Book goes back uh, to um, 2011, 2012. <clears throat> this, is, um, this is when I knew uh, by introduction uh, from our, one of our consultants, I was introduced to the youngest sibling to, um, of the Rainbow Suite. Um, as part of the uh, a project we were uh, uh, trying to execute at our end. And uh, I must admit, um, I mean, uh, I, I fell in love with it. I mean, the 99 Green Book, uh, uh, I, you can consider me a, a fan uh, of, the, of the Green Book 99. Uh, and I do think it's a perfect form of contract for its intended purpose. And again, of course, we can discuss about intended purpose uh, um, uh, you know, later on. And, and this uh, takes me back to the poll question uh, that would, uh, was asked at the beginning. Yes, indeed, there is a perception. Uh, maybe um, uh, you know, the, the FIDIC guide of uh, 2000, the FIDIC contracts guide contributed to that perception in the market that the Green Book uh, 99 is only for um, projects of low uh, monetary value or short duration or simple repetitive works, which indeed it is uh, as, as a prime uh, intention. But as the foreword uh, to the Green Book 99 says, uh, if uh, depending on the type and circumstances of the project, it is indeed uh, and could be um, uh, suited and could be used for projects of higher um, monetary value. So I used it uh, for a project uh, of multi-million dollars. Um, um, however, it was for a short duration. Uh, the, the project uh, um, was for a corporate office fit out uh, in Abu Dhabi, um, a big uh, company relocating from one location to a central uh, business district. Uh, obviously, several constraints um, associated with the new development uh, from the landlord, uh, from the base build, you have to deal with the, the base build. Other issues relating to the uh, uh, approvals and permits, whether from whether statutory approvals or approvals indeed by the landlord and his consultants because of the base build conditions. Interestingly enough, we had to deal with nominated subcontractors um, to not to um, you know, affect the warranty uh, for some uh, services uh, already installed within the development and in the base build, some restrictions to the service lift. So access to the site was not exclusive to the contractor. Uh, we had to look for sectional handover because we had to have a, a data center that needs to be taken over earlier than the rest of the, of the works to enable connections and, and so forth. So you can imagine uh, dealing with <clears throat> all these constraints, sorry. Uh, and of course, as a result of that, we had to amend the Green Book. Uh, however, the decision made to continue with the recommendation or to heed the advice given to us by the consultant, because Surprisingly enough, at least to me, maybe unsurprisingly to others, the Green Book 99 at the time was widely used in UAE and the Middle East and probably also in Egypt in this field, corporate uh, and or hospitality 
and or retail or shopping mall um, fit out. These projects, I mean, uh, by nature, uh, they, they comprise, you know, multi um, discipline, i.e. you will need to deal with subcontractors uh, extensively. And this was, of course, something that was not catered for under the 99 uh, Green Book. So all in all, uh, we had to uh, follow the advice because the market and the, the, the tenderers, who one of them would be our contractor, were quite familiar with the 99 Green Book. So we had to amend it, uh, but uh, with care, we took care of this. Although at the time, uh, the, the golden principles were not yet published. Uh, so we amended it, but we didn't butcher it beyond recognition uh, as, uh, as Hosni always warns uh, users uh, to be careful with amending any of the standard uh, forms. So uh, indeed there, there were amendments and I don't deny they were extensive, but it, it remained recognizable as uh, the Green Book as a FIDIC uh, contract, and the amendments were, were, uh, were made carefully under the uh, particular conditions. So why I mentioned this? Because when I was given the opportunity to join TG8, uh, a lot of those amendments that I felt necessary at the time to suit the project nature, you know, to expand on the subcontractors and subcontracting, uh, because under the 99 Green Book, subcontracting is not anticipated to be, uh, you know, utilized as mentioned in the foreword and as mentioned in the guidance notes. There is only two lines uh, subclose on subcontracting, and we had to expand on that. You know, sectional handover was not there, and we used it. So the majority. Uh, uh, if not all of these uh, aspects that we had to deal with in terms of amendments and necessary amendments, they the users will find them addressed and included in the uh, 2021 uh, second edition uh, of, of the Green Book. And this comes from the field. At the time, uh, I think I made the comment, I was trying to voice uh, some messages I heard uh, in the market. The market was really in need. There was such a big demand for, there was no, at the time, there was no happy medium between the 99 Green Book and the 99 uh, Red Book, uh, if you like. So there was a demand for something that caters for the middle uh, ground. And, um, when I say so, uh, that doesn't uh, really mean that the intention behind the second edition was only to uh, respond to this demand. The intention is as described by Vincent, is uh, it's an, an, an alternative to the 2017 red and yellow books, but for cases whereby the parties feel that the risk does not really uh, justify mobilizing such an expanded uh, contract administration machinery, as is the case uh, under the major the major groups. So, in continuation of uh, what uh, Vincent mentioned, uh, I will try and, and expand a little bit on some of the main features uh, included in the uh, second edition. Some of those, uh, including separating in express provisions the claims and the variations. The claims and variations under the 99 Green Book were part of subclause 10.5. Under the second edition, uh, there will be express provisions separating uh, claims from uh, the, the variations in form and in uh, substance. Um, and the variations, as Vincent also uh, mentioned, will now be clearly set out as uh, having two procedures one express one and direct one by instruction. And in that case, the contractor will have to follow the instruction and uh, proceed with the execution of the variation expeditiously, and then submit the particulars later on for a retrospective uh, adjustment to the contract price uh, and or EOT. <clears throat> The other case will be by request for proposal, whereby the engineer can request the contractor to submit a variation proposal. In that case, it has to be a prospective adjustment. This is the intention. So the contractor will submit a proposal as soon as practicable to the engineer, and the engineer will review the proposal and agree 
to the content, including adjustment to the uh, contract price and or the uh, EOT, the, the time for completion. And if acceptable, then the instruction will be given to proceed with the variation, including those agreed um, adjustment. If not, and still the uh, employer is in need of the variation, the engineer can always still instruct the variation and then the procedure under uh, variation by instruction will, will, be, uh, will apply. Uh, Mahmoud, this is, uh, thank you. Can you please wrap up uh, because we're over time? Thank you. Sure, thank you, Hosni, for the, for the notice. So uh, quickly, I want to uh, touch on the uh, novelties, as uh, Vincent liked to call them, uh, the new part of the new features uh, of the Green Book uh, um, are the prolongation cost. And uh, later on, we can uh, discuss or explain how they are calculated. Um, expanding on the LDs um, from the 99 Green Book, uh, to have LDs in case of termination. Now this is expanded to also in case of omissions under uh, variation. Uh, also the insurance uh, certificate is uh, provided as a medium for evidence of affecting uh, the insurance. And actually the big, big addition will be the forms, the communication forms that will come in handy as we all uh, believe to anyone at the remote site scratching his head, he doesn't know how to send a notice or a letter to the employer or from, from the uh, engineer to, to the contractor or how to come up with an IPC. So these extensive uh, communication forms uh, will come in handy and they will be in an editable PDF format, will only require some minor filling uh, by the user and off you go, uh, he, he can have a notice or a letter that is uh, fully complying with the intended uh, uh, feature uh, and uh, provisions of the new Green Book. I would leave it there. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Hosni, and thank you all for uh, your attention. Uh, thank you, Mahmoud. Thank you so much. Uh, now we'll mo move on to our um, uh, third uh, speaker for uh, today, uh, which is uh, uh, Francis uh, Burga. Uh, Francis is a senior contracts and uh, procurement officer at the ILO uh, Procurement Bureau in Geneva, International Labour Organization. Uh, she has a degree in law and political science from the University of Lima in Peru and a Master of European Law from the University of Saarland in Germany. Uh, she is a certified information privacy professional for Europe by the International Association of Privacy Professionals. Uh, she has more than 20 years of experience in international contracts uh, law, having worked at Inter-American Development Bank in Lima, private sector uh, at so many uh, uh, projects in Rotterdam and The Hague, uh, at the Netherlands, also embassy in Santiago de Chile, and since 2018 at the ILO. So now we will hear a user's uh, uh, perspective from uh, uh, Francis. Francis, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Hosni. Thank you also to Philip for this invitation, for us, the International Labour Organization, the Procurement Bureau, to share our experience on the use of the Green Book. And thank you to all of you, of course, for participating in this discussion. Um, so just a small correction, Hosni, I started working at the ILO in 2008. And that is actually when we had our first contact with Philip and also with the use of the, of the Green Book. Um, what was interesting is that in back in 2008, uh, we were working in a, I mean, implementing a development cooperation project in Indonesia, and the project was funded by the World Bank. And at the time, the World Bank, as you know, they use sorts of the, the FIDIC uh, different books. Uh, this uh, World Bank um, project was using the, the Green Book, um, as well as the government in Indonesia in their tenders. And upon an assessment of, of the different contracting tools that we could use, and also for a question of ensuring consistency in the contracting system in this project, uh, we decided to use the Green Book as well. Ever since, since 2008, uh, we have been using the Green Book. We have been in contact with FIDIC. We, we have been purchasing licenses agreement to uh, adapt the Green Book to our needs and to the local context. Um, so just to, to, to mention, we as a specialized agency of the United Nations system, we have uh, 187 member states and we implement projects all around the world. 
not all of them are related to construction, but on those that are uh, small works, we use the green book. Um, what we were looking was for a standard that we could use that could allow a certain flexibility, which is what we consider important with a green book. Uh, so just for background information to, to mention that the approach that we have on construction is based on a, the ILO methodology that is called the employment intensive investment. The purpose of that is to address an employment through uh, labor intensive works. So the, what we aim is that, um, so these works necessitate a la large number of workers and the work is based on simple and repetitive tasks. So mainly we deal with road rehabilitation with uh, road maintenance. So this green book based also on the FIDI guidance and what uh, Van San had already explained on, on the use of uh, FIDI proved to be a great tool, not only as a contracting tool, but also uh, because uh, part of our projects is to build the capacity of vendors in the market, but also of the, of the population in the country. So in combination with the trainings that FIDIC uh, provides on the use of the FIDIC and our trainings, trainings based on uh, the application of international labor standards has proven to be a, a great cooperation with FIDIC. Um, so recently, uh, recently means uh, in the last two years, I would say, uh, we have been using the Green Book in uh, countries such as uh, Madagascar, in Mauritania, in uh, Timor-Leste, in the Lebanon, in the, the Comoro Islands. And um, again, what we are trying to do is that we have the general conditions of FIDIC and then we uh, adapt it through the particular conditions which is now I see the new um, approach that this second edition has. And in the particular conditions, what we have building up is uh, the international labor standards of the, of, of the organization. So as you know, the FIDI Green Book and all the green books have as one of the obligations of the contractor, the compliance with local laws. So we are complementing this with the application of international labor standards, such as, for instance, the, the prohibition of child labor, the prohibition of forced labor, the principle of non-discrimination based on equal pay for equal work, based on our decent work agenda. And one other element that we also consider important when we, we were doing this legal assessment of the, of the Green Book is that we consider that it does have the, I would say, an equitable um, balance between the rights and the obligations of, of, of the parties. So the employer on one hand and the contractor on the other hand. Uh, now, looking at the new uh, edition, at the 2021 and the revisions that have been uh, done, uh, so Van San had already mentioned uh, many of them. Uh, the ones that maybe I would like to just to emphasize because we really welcome these, um, these revisions are the one on the use of the guarantees. Uh, as you know, we had, I mean, the Green Book already has this retention of monies and also the possibility of half the performance guarantee. However, in the particular conditions we had already, and of course, depend on the country and depends on the amounts, but we had been asking contractors to submit also bank guarantees for the case of advance payment, some in cases of performance guarantees as well, and also what we call the warranty guarantee uh, after for the defects and liability. And one other element, element that we welcome as well is um, that although in the previous version, it was possible, of course, to build the structure of payment schedule and, and the amount based on the different options, like uh, whether you are using bill of quantities or not, whether you are paying in one installment or in, in, in progress payments. Uh, now it is now much clearer in this uh, 2021 um, edition when you have the different options with some guidance. So this is also, uh, we consider a very, very um, a great improvement on that. Uh, I would say I would stop here. And maybe if later, if there are some questions and answers, I'm, I'm more than happy to, to answer those. Thank you, Jose. Over to you. Thank you, Francis. Thank you so much. Uh, now let's move on to our uh, uh, last speaker uh, for today, uh, which is uh, Richard Tourud. Uh, or English, Richard. Uh, Richard is the Director of the International Affairs of the French Federation of Public Works, FNTP. He's the Director General of the French Union of International Contractors, SEFI. 
He's the vice chair of the BIC's development committee. Uh, BIC is the business at OECD, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. He's the chair of the College of Economic Players at the National Council of Development and International Solidarity, CNDSI. He's the head of the working group, Multilateral Development Banks of the Confederation of International Contractors Association, CICA, former general counsel of Vinci Construction Grant Projects. He is also uh, he has been for the past 40 years as an in-house uh, lawyer uh, for uh, engineering project management and contracting uh, uh, companies working, having an experience in international construction projects. So uh, we have uh, Richard as a great uh, uh, speaker also, in addition to our speakers, as you can see, he represents so many federations and entities as a user of the Green Book. So uh, Richard, without further ado, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Lusni. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Um, we are very thankful to FIDIC for giving us, as uh, representatives of the contractors and as friendly reviewers, the possibility to take a look at the clauses of the coming new edition of the Green Book. We are even more grateful, of course, that a significant number of our suggestions were accepted and uh, adopted in the current version. As contractors, uh, we were not completely surprised, though, that a not less significant number of our proposals were not approved. And we are again grateful to FIDIC to give us this opportunity today to share some of our concerns with the audience who could perhaps give their opinion during the Q&A session. First topic, subcontractors. Mahmoud has spoken about that new provision. Still, there is no exception to the rule imposing the engineer's consent to the choice of subcontractors by the uh, contractor. The contradiction remains in our eyes between this rule and the clause whereby the contractor is fully responsible for the subcontractor's works, acts, and defaults. For us, if the contractor is fully responsible, he must be at liberty to choose its subcontractors, at least for non-essential parts of the works. Imposing the engineer's consent implies that the engineer has a better knowledge of the subcontractor's skills and capacity than the contractor, which is generally not true. Not only does the current drafting enable the engineer to put illegitimate pressure on the contractor, it's also an incentive on dishonest engineers, there are some, to seek undue advantages from the subcontractors they impose against the, con the contractor's wishes. Second topic would be conditions precedent. This issue is not fully addressed. The effective date of the contract is the date of signature of the contract agreement by the employer. Then the commencement date, which is to occur uh, no later than 28 days thereafter, is determined by the engineer. But the usual condition precedent to either of those two dates, such as issuance of bank guarantees, access right, site possession, advance payment, do not qualify as conditions precedent in the current drafting. We see this as a problem. Um, in the current drafting of the contract data, for instance, access, access to the site and site possession are not, uh, are not uh, granted before, but after the commencement date. Um, Normally, they are granted before the commencement date, unless, of course, the contractor is in charge of the design. But normally, site installation starts um, on day one. So in order to solve this problem, we uh, would prefer to reduce the time limit for submittal of the bank guarantees and for the payment of the advance so that it becomes a condition precedent to the commencement date. Instead of being arbitrarily determined by the engineer at its discretion, the commencement date should be uh, the date when all con conditions precedent are met, including access rights, site possession, and last but not least, 
advance payment. Third topic, liquidated damages. Um, uncapped liquidated damages remain possible due to the presence of the words, if any, in the clause. Uh, this possibility of unlimited liquidated damages uh, is only apparently wonderful for employers. In reality, it is not. It would certainly encourage some of them to take advantage of that possibility, but with adverse results. Bad contractors will accept and cap liquidated damages and provide poor quality work or go bankrupt if late. And good contractors will either refuse depriving employers from their operation or negotiate to change the clause before signing the contract. In all cases, employers and contractors have a joint interest in a fair clause where, where liquidated damages must be capped. Not to mention the fact that the current drafting would expose FIDIC of the criticism um, of being imbalanced. Again, on liquidated damages, when a part of the works is taken over by the employer, the daily amount of the liquidated damages is proportionately reduced. Wouldn't it be logical for the maximum amount of the liquidated damages to be proportionately reduced as well? If the daily amount is reduced and the maximum amount is not, then the number of days of potential delay increases, which is not necessarily good to the employer and does not reduce the contractor's risk as it should. Third topic, the, uh, fourth topic, sorry, definitions. The definition of the word laws includes regulations, but I'm not 100% sure that technical standards fall under the category of regulations. To avoid any doubt and to prevent useless conflicts, the term technical standards should maybe appear in the list as such. Fifth topic, plant and materials. In the second sentence of that provision 411, we can read, quote, all plant and materials on site shall be deemed to be the property of the employer, unquote. It is standard practice for contractors to order and bring on the site more plant and materials than theoretically needed. In, to face possible breakage, theft, or other deteriorations. How will the contractor be entitled to take away its surplus planting materials after taking over the works if such surplus are deemed to be in the ownership of the employer? If what remains of these planting materials in excess on completion may not be repatriated by the contractor, his prudence may become a problem. Topic number six, I have only 10. Taking over certificate. The engineer now has 28 days to issue the taking over certificate to the contractor. In the 99 edition, the taking over was immediate. From the contractor's perspective, this is a deterioration of the conditions. And the subclause is also silent about the, the engineer's silence at the expiry of the time period. Does it mean approval or rejection? We don't know. Seventh topic, final payment, an important topic. In the 99 edition, the time limit for final payment was 28 days. Now the time limit appears to be 56 days. We understand that the employer needs some time after the engineer's issuance of the final payment certificate to the employer, but a more reasonable solution would be 21 days for the engineer's review of the contractor statement, plus seven days for payment via the employer. The total would remain 28 days as before. Topic number eight, bank guarantees. The time limit currently 21 days for the return of the bank guarantees to the contractor in the end of the contract should be reduced no employer may be so poorly organized that it would take him three weeks to mail a one-page document. 
And ultimately, the employer bears the risk. He bears the bank's fees for the duration shown in the subclause since the contractor includes, includes those costs in its price. Topic number nine, insurance. Uh, it seems we were unsuccessful in our attempt to convince FIDIC to delete the last sentence of subclause 12.12, uh, which imposes on request the contractor to provide copy of its insurance policies to the employer. The fact is that the text of group insurance policies is confidential, and we believe brokers or insurer certificates should be sufficient to comfort the employer that those provisions comply with the uh, employer's requirements. This clause for us remains a problem. Topic number 10. Um, uh, can can we wrap up quickly, please? We're over time. We're way over time. Could you please just quickly wrap up? Thank you. 30 seconds, thank you. We propose that the adjudicator's decision should determine which party should finally bear which part of the adjudicator's fees and expenses relevant to the dispute. The absence of such addition could be construed so that such fees and expenses remain equally shared regardless to the decision, which would be unfair to the succeeding party. Sorry for the delay. Thank you, Usni. Uh, thank you, Richard. Thank you so much. Um, uh, we had uh, some uh, uh, action on the chat box. We have uh, so many questions, but the recurring question was, and I think it is directed to uh, Vincent, uh, people still have this misconception about uh, uh, the value of the project will uh, uh, dictate whether you use the Green Book or not, and people think that it is, it is only expanded in the 2021 to go at higher values. So, so could you please, uh, Vincent, uh, revisit this quickly to highlight uh, uh, how, how and when we use the Green Book, whether 1999 or 2021. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Thank you, Osni. Yeah. To summarize, no value that we take into account. There is no threshold for, for which we would say above that threshold, go red, yellow, below that threshold, go green. Uh, what counts is, first of all, the level of risk that you envisage for your project. If it's low risk project, then you can go for it. Second criteria, if you want to have a simplified contract machinery and you do not really intend to mobilize extensive contract administration resources. If you go red, yellow 2017, you typically go for high risk project, high capital value project, and you have a contract manager dedicated to the job which can follow, who can follow sorry, all of the procedural paths which are described uh, therein. Uh, so, uh, to summarize, the development banks, as I said, uh, often use the threshold of $10 million between small works, large works. That's only an indicative value that they use. We are not uh, following that threshold. Also, of course, small works contract financed by World Bank, ADB, or others can be using the new green book. But typically in my field of water infrastructure projects, I've been running projects of water infrastructure pipelines, deep wells, booster stations, reservoirs, capital value, 20, 30 million dollars. This new green book is perfectly suitable for this kind of environment where the complexity of the project uh, and the risk of the project is not perceived to be uh, high. So yes, I appreciate the need for people to have a value because it gives certainty and confidence, but we want to stay away from that. Thank you, Vincent. Another question to TG8 uh, with regards to the prolongation cost. What is the new structure for it? And you or Mahmoud are free to answer. Anyone from TG8? Okay, maybe I could, Mahmoud, if you want, I could uh, rapidly uh, summarize this. Basically, what will happen is that you will take into account the value of the work certified at the time of the delay event occurring. So if you have a delay event occurring from the start, uh, before any work is carried out, before any work is certified for payment, uh, what we will take into account is that prolongation cost will amount to a fraction of a so-called factor W. W is the weight of overheads on the job. Uh, so we have taken the starting point of 20%, 20% of the contract price being the weight of on-site and off-site overheads. Um, and of course, that's a general level. 
So if you are in, um, in a country where you have difficult security situations, where you need to mobilize guards, uh, specific safety measures, uh, of course, the weight of on-site overheads might be higher. And so you will need to amend this in the contract data. But the average point has been to say, okay, 10% for head office overhead, 5 to 10% for head office overhead, uh, 10, 10 to 15% of on-site overheads. And here you go with a, a rough uh, ballpark estimate of 20%. And then that weight uh, of the contract uh, price, you divide it by the number of days of the time for completion, and that gives you a weight per day for the overheads. If you have a new OT of, let's say, 20 days, you will multiply the 20 days by that weight, and you will have an additional weighing factor, which is related to the value of the work certified, as I mentioned. If you are in the peak production period of your goals, uh, curve, uh, goals curve for the the production on the project. This is where you have the full blow of your resources mobilized. You are producing at full steam and you will take 125% of that uh, factor W. If you are at the start, you are just mobilizing, you have not yet uh, delivered any work, you will only take 25% of it. And if you are in the first third or the last third of the uh, works carried out, you will take 60% of that uh, weight. Uh, so that's it uh, in a nutshell. Okay, thank you, Vincent. Now let's move on on the user side, uh, Francis and uh, Richard. And we received so many questions asking about the new role of the engineer. So I would like ask uh, Richard as a contractor, Francis as an employer, or in turn, uh, whoever wishes to go first. Uh, uh, what do you feel with regards to the difference between the green book where the employer can represent itself as a contract administrator under the contract or the employer's representative, as opposed to the, the default option now under 2021 where we need an engineer with the option to appoint an employer representative. So ladies first, let's start with Francis. If I may say, so we haven't yet um, had the opportunity to use this uh, new edition and to put it in practice. So I don't have uh, that much experience. Uh, I, I, there was an, an issue mentioned by, the, by Monsieur Turut uh, with refer to the role of the engineer and with, uh, in relation to the subcontractors as well. And this could be considered a challenge. Um, I, in, in my opinion, I mean, again, it's something that the experience will, will show because if indeed the contractor remains the main responsible. And that's what we have on our terms and conditions. Uh, if parts of our, our contract are subcontracted, still the contractor will be the main responsible. Uh, so to which extent the engineer has a say, for instance, in, 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 in that part of the chain and on the approval, uh, we do want to ensure that the quality of the work uh, I mean, that the subcontractors will ensure the same quality of the work that we would expect from the contractor, because in the tender uh, process, normally it is the contractor, and unless the subcontract part, uh, party, so the subcontractors and the work are already identified, we will be also evaluating those subcontractors. But if that's not the case, um, I would say that we will uh, do want to evaluate subcontractors, but that again will have we cannot I would say unreasonable impose uh, contracting with certain companies or vetting certain companies. Uh, I'm not sure if I answer. I may answer just from that perspective because I don't have experience with other roles of the engineer. So maybe I can pass the floor if you want to to another uh, panelist. Yes, uh, Richard, how do you feel uh, with regards to this as a contractor? 1999 employer employer representative administering the contract as opposed to the new 2021 the default option is the engineer your take on it as a contractor yeah actually I, i've been um, using the 91 99 fidic contract for on a very big contract in uh, nelson's country in nigeria a few years ago for a very big project so i, I have a practical experience of the previous edition. And uh, I was very um, happy with it, actually, uh, due to its flexibility. But the fact was that, you know, this form was used basically for minor projects or minor low, low level, low amount, uh, reduced uh, time for completion. So um, I'm very glad that now we have a more substantial form of contract which will be adapted to uh, projects of you know uh, bigger 
uh, amounts, longer duration, bigger stakes. So I, I believe this is really an improvement. And in the text, there are a number of improvements. Personally, on the question whether the engineer is the right solution versus employer's representative, I, I'm, I've never been very comfortable with the concept of engineer being uh, fully independent from the uh, employer. And I realized that it, it's better for Philippe to admit that save for determinations, the engineer is actually representing the employer. So I don't believe the distinction has a, a significant value anymore. So I'm not, you know, I don't feel uncomfortable with the concept of the engineer being active in the green book. I think it's also an improvement if you know you want to uh, use it for bigger projects. Thank you so much. Uh, going back to TG8, uh, we received so many questions asking how, in terms of the size of the book itself, number of pages and words, uh, 2021 compared to 1999, and several questions asking, uh, is it the 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 uh, the final 2021 uh, to be released? Is it very much different from the pre-release draft released last year? So. Mahmoud maybe can answer this. Thank you, Hosni. I uh, am a bit suspicious. Uh, sus I mean, I don't know. Is Edward is Edward in the uh, in the audience? <laughs> yes, he <Okay>. is. <laughs> <laughs> the question is from from Edward Corbett. <laughs> okay, Ed. Uh, good to see you. I mean, uh, well, uh, we took good care of your green book, Edward, if, if that's what you are asking about. Uh, you know, I remember him uh, making the comment, I think, two years or three years ago in London and, uh, when the TG8 was uh, announced and uh, we were starting our work. And he said, make sure you take good care of my green book. And then I, I, I can feel for Edward. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I am a fan of the 99 Green Book. That's, that's a fact. However, it remains, you know, everything needs to be taken in context. Uh, the Green Book 99 as drafted, indeed was drafted as mentioned in the foreword. It is for repetitive, simple work, uh, you know, uh, you know so, but the value issue was where you have this flexibility. And obviously, as quite rightly mentioned in the guidance notes of the 99 Green Book, which is uh, actually a must read, and I would recommend to anyone using the 99 Green Book, if he hasn't done so, to read them thoroughly in the same scrutiny and uh, careful uh, reading of the general conditions. This is where you, you can get into the minds of the drafters and find out what's the intent, what's the rationale behind the drafting of the GCs as they are, and what are the alternatives if you are faced with a different uh, situation. So having taken due regard of what Vincent mentioned, and now over 21 years uh, later, and uh, the, the, you know, the, the landscape of the construction industry after the publication of the 2017 second edition of the major books, Indeed, there, there is a need to update the, the 99 Green Book. Now, for people who are really fond of counting pages, uh, I, you know, there is no simple answer to this. I mean, if the, the 99 Green Book was 10 pages uh, of uh, general conditions and equally 10 pages of very useful guidance notes. I think, uh, Vincent, if I, if I remember well, I think now the, the general conditions are about 25 pages. 20, yeah. More, 26 pages and we have roughly 10,000 words. Yeah, so I mean, it, to me, it's, it's a yes and no, it's, it's yes. Some people may look at this, but this is not the substance. I mean, uh, what, what counts and what matters in my view is that is it fit for purpose or not? If now we are talking about a more complex project, relatively speaking, to the ones primarily, um, you know, born in mind at the time of drafting the 99 Green Book, simple repetitive work. Now we're talking about a different, uh, you know, um, project nature. And if we are looking at, you know, uh, addressing some of the, you know, why I choose to go back to how I used the 99 Green Book and gave the example, because it was about $11 million worth of work. 
over seven months, but it had all the things that you can come across. You had special specialist subcontractors, which is something not contemplated under the 99 dream book. We had sectional handover. We had HSE requirements of, uh, of the development. We had very, very complicated uh, approval and permits uh, requirements. And so we had to amend it. Now, all these amendments to cater for these situations are already there by default. If someone would like to use the, the 2021 Green Book for a very, very, very simple you know, project, I would say, yes, he can reduce or he can still use the 99 Green Book. So I think both of them will complement each other um, and, and they are primarily for different uh, purposes. Um, I, hope, I hope this answers the question, uh, but again, uh, hi, Ed, uh, hopefully all is well. Uh, looking forward to seeing you soon. <laughs> Thank you, Mahmoud. Uh, I guess it's uh, the end uh, for us. Uh, I always say it's a matter of content, not kilos. And I've seen so many discussions about keeping the short form and intermediate. Uh, it is a matter of uh, requirements of the project and the most appropriate contract to that project rather than the number of pages having a short or a light contract or something intermediate. It is a contract which and which answers to a certain need at certain projects. This is how we uh, uh, we uh, categorize our uh, contracts and uh, place them. Uh, thank you all. This is the end of the Q and A. Before I hand over to Nelson, I think it is time for poll number two. So, Barbara, could you please um, uh, show us uh, poll number two to end for today? Okay. So the question is, uh, what is the final tier of dispute resolution under the 2021 Green Book? Remember, I guess uh, uh, Vincent talked about it. Is it the on-central uh, arbitration, uh, ICC rules of arbitration, ICC rules of arbitration expedited procedure provisions or FedEx rules of arbitration? Okay, Barbara, can we see the results of the second poll? Okay, thank you so much. Uh, so 11% uh, for the first option, 70% uh, for second option, 31% for the third option, ICC rules of arbitration, expedited procedure provisions, and 41% for the FIDIC rules of arbitration. Unfortunately, we don't have FIDIC rules of arbitration and the correct answer to this is option C, ICC rules of arbitration, expedited procedure, provisions. And on that bombshell, I hand over to Nelson with a delay of one minute and 30 seconds. Thank you so much. Well, Husni, thank you very much for that. Actually, it's quite good to actually do that testing because what we're testing is a lot of people seem to have the impression that there is a clear rule on the appreciation. We do follow the ICC, and I think it's quite important that we bring that to context. But it now really, you know, it's my pleasure to just do a step back. Whilst I need to come back and say massive thank you to uh, all the speaker, to Husni and to the panelists uh, for all your time, based looking at, you know, what does the, you know, Green Book 2021 look like and what does good look like a comparison and also to have the user perspective has been extremely helpful so thank you very much for that and at this point in time some of you are aware that we've produced you know what i call the guidance memorandum to deal with the COVID 19 uh, we did you know quite well because of the speed of our contract committee in producing this last year and i'm really pleased that moving forward now we've moved to the next stage where we're producing something really for the purpose of the consultant and the client. So at this point in time, I'm going to invite Vincent Lulu, who is the chair of the FIDE contract committee, to just you know give us a snippet, an insight to what that particular guidance is before we wrap up. So Vincent, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, Nelson. And uh, <clears throat> just to introduce this uh, new guidance memorandum that, you, that will be published uh, pretty soon in the next coming days or even hours, um, what we wanted to do this year, uh, because you re may remember that last year we produced a guidance memorandum for those of you using our FIDIC forms of works contract. We wanted this year to focus on the impact 
that COVID-19 has on the consultant services under the FIDIC suite of uh, contracts and agreements. So of course, we had a look at uh, uh, the FIDIC White Book 2017 edition, the FIDIC uh, subconsultancy agreement and the FIDIC uh, GV agreements, books which I had the, the pleasure to co-draft with my colleagues. And uh, we wanted to highlight some typical scenarios that consultants could be uh, coming across. So for example, effects of lockdowns and border closures on services delivered by a consultant with various sub-scenarios to look at. What kind of services are you dealing with? Are you dealing with a feasibility study, for example, or a design stage uh, for which that you may be able to work remotely with your uh, design, uh, design uh, uh, engineers and working with the distance uh, from the job site? Or is it something for which your presence on site is required? And if your presence on site is required, such as when you act as the engineer under a FIDIC uh, works contract, uh, are you uh, an international firm or a national firm? And therefore, are you impacted or not uh, by border closures and uh, limitations to the, uh, the flow of uh, people and goods uh, through borders? Uh, also, whether those measures have been taken into account, those COVID-19 measures which may have been decided by a local government, have they been enforced prior to the date of the consultant offer or not, which will trigger whether you can rely on our change in legislation provisions. And you can look at clause 1.5, for example, of the FIDIC White Book 2017. Finally, whether those measures can qualify as an exceptional uh, event uh, based on the definition of the exceptional event, the fourth criteria which are uh, set out therein, uh, and of course, one uh, important criteria, which is uh, uh, when the event occurs, is there anything that you can reasonably do to avoid or overcome the effect uh, of the uh, event? Um, also, another scenario is when there are no measures like this, but there are internal health and safety policies, policies from either the client or the consultant, preventing presence uh, of the consultant at site or at client's premises. You can also see whether an, an exceptional event argument can run. Of course, don't forget that an exceptional argument, uh, exceptional event, sorry, uh, is not uh, something which is caused by either party. So uh, you may have a difficulty there. So you would have to look at whether uh, the COVID-19 health and safety impact on the job uh, was ju uh, proper justification for your decision internally not to go to uh, the site you'll have to take into account the standard of care which is expected uh, uh, by the consultant under clause 3.3 of the white book and uh, which is to act with a reasonable skill and care and diligence that would be expected from the consultant operating in the same type of project and under the same type of conditions uh, than you uh, so the, the reference level will not be your act but the act of an experienced consultant acting uh, in a similar situation. Um, we look also at the role of the consultant acting as FIDIC engineer and the key uh, obligation not to uh, make sure that for uh, any claim situation, uh, the uh, engineer uh, consult with both parties in an endeavor to reach agreement. And if that fails, to make a fair determination. Also the supervision duties of the engineer in particular with uh, the compliance which is required with health and safety obligations. And finally, we looked at the case of a GV agreement when you have a defaulting member. Don't forget you have a joint and several liability towards your clients. So if you are the non-defaulting uh, GV uh, member, then you have, of course, to step in and uh, uh, cater for the uh, default caused by your, uh, your partner. And finally, all contract administration duties have been uh, uh, summarized and reminded in terms of notices, especially for uh, exceptional events, but also for claims. The need for contemporary record is not an express requirement of the white book per se, uh, but this is something that is required in order to prove your entitlement and the burden to prove uh, lies with the claimant under most jurisdictions. So you will have, of course, to think about those records to substantiate your own case. And don't forget also that in the white book, uh, which is a specificity in our FIDIC forms, we have good faith obligations. Uh, so under clause 116, the parties have to act in good faith in performing their obligations under the contract. Uh, that's it's also to be borne in mind. And because as for the uh, guidance memo on FIDIC works contract, we reminded uh, uh, the users that uh, the solution for a COVID-19 impact on your job is not necessarily to be found, be beyond, to be found between sorry, 
uh, and within the four corners of a contract, look at the impact of the governing law, uh, especially in civil law jurisdictions where you have force majeure, uh, which is uh, uh, enshrined in the, the civil law of the country. Uh, also, uh, nothing prevents you to to, to, to design, to uh, define some specific uh, solutions for that specific and unique event. We have, uh, again, reflected the fact that many, many governments uh, across the world have recommended their uh, supply chain, public and private employers, to uh, uh, take a rather lenient approach to this and not necessarily to apply strictly uh, the contractual and legal provisions are at stake. And France, for example, the government has rec recommended public employers to nevertheless share some of the additional costs borne bon bon by the supply chain because of the COVID-19 impact. Well, that's a recommendation, but anyhow, it's quite uh, influential. Uh, and finally, uh, to define some pragmatic but objective uh, solutions, because of course, COVID-19 can be seen as a uh, a convenient excuse to hide and cover each and every uh, contractor's culpable or consultant culpable uh, hiccups or issues. So, of course, causation remains critical to make sure that uh, the issues which are being claimed uh, are really caused by COVID-19 uh, and are not caused by any other event which could have uh, or any other matter which could have occurred otherwise anyhow uh, and but for the, the pandemic. So that's it in a nutshell of what you we can expect to find uh, in our upcoming uh, guidance uh, memo. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, you know, Vincent, uh, for that uh, overview of what the guidance memorandum contains. Um, as you probably get from the chat room, uh, this is now available on our website for download for our members and for the stakeholders across the industry. Uh, and it now leads me to the point where I need to bring back the president uh, and ask him to sort of share some few words with us about what is it that we've already covered, what do we need to take away, and where best you know, shall we move forward to the next level. So, Tony, if you are there, uh, I think the floor is yours. Tony. Thank you, Nelson. Um, firstly, thank you uh, to our panelists. I found the discussion very interesting, and the idea that one of you is able to work out who the questioner is without looking at the chat box, I think is pretty impressive. Uh, it, it proves this is a tight community. Uh, it proves it's a community that cooperates and collaborates in the development of these contracts. And uh, to me, that's a great thing. I do take on board both the good uh, and the bad, if you like, with the criticisms and the construction, uh, constructive comments that have been made. I think they're all extremely valuable to get that level of input and it's very important to our process that we are able and are open uh, to this sort of discussion and collaboration. It's the only way we'll get best in class international standard contracts. So I certainly appreciate and value uh, the discussion that's occurred here uh, today for most of you. Um, I, I would also uh, add that I cannot uh, think uh, of a more important work than to continue the development of the contracts in the way that uh, has been the case. The de delivery of infrastructure around the world is absolutely critical. The amount of investment that is made in infrastructure around the world is huge. And it's very important from the profession's point of view and from the industry more broadly to make sure that projects are delivered in an appropriate way under appropriate contracts. Uh, I congratulate you all. I thank the panelists. I thank the task group again for the great work they've done. Uh, there will be some takeaways and no doubt further discussions uh, final, uh, prior to final uh, uh, publication, but uh, I certainly look forward to that uh, later in the year at the International Conference, Contracts uh, Users Conference. So thank you very much and thank you, Husni, for, for sharing. Thank you. Thanks, Nelson. Thank yeah, thanks very much, uh, Tony, for that closing statement. I just leave me to really close out on few points. Uh, for me, as the Secretary, uh, just to remind you that we do have our next uh, committee conference webinar coming up on the 16th of November. Uh, we have the next state of the world on the 14th of October, and there will be other, you know, COVID-related uh, webinar coming up in due course. Um, just before I bring the matter to a close, uh, we probably know that the biggest subject and the big elephant in the room right now is called climate change. And this is going to impact our world, whether we like it or not. FIDIC is currently developing a new charter, which will cut across everything that FIDIC does, from our own as an organization in terms of governance, 
our practical activity day-to-day -day work, and the way we put our best practice documentation standard out is going to be something that we'll be looking at as an organization. And I will be looking into contract committee to look at how do we decarbonize our industry, both in terms of our existing infrastructure or building or the new one to be built. All of those are critical. But just to go back to uh, and just echo what Tony said, a massive thank you to Husni uh, for taking the leadership instead of a uh, hosting this particular meeting. Uh, thank you very much to Vincent uh, for his leadership on the contract committee, for Mahmoud, his contribution from Francis and for Richard and for all the contribution that's been made during the particular issue. Yes, there were issues asked about when do you use the particular you know, Green Book 2021? Is it small or large? I think we had the opportunity to debate that. What about the issue about prolongation? That was raised. We had the opportunity to discuss that. The role of engineer, that was raised. We have opportunity to discuss that. The size and the complexity, that was raised. We picked that up. And also the issue about what is the difference between the pre-document that was launched last year and what we put out today. Again, we have the opportunity to look at that. Hopefully in November this year or December, we have the final document. And I hope you're all looking forward to seeing that. So without further ado, I want to say massive thank you to all the speakers and the president for supporting us, and also the staff of Philip behind the wall, which is Barbara, the team, who are making sure that we have registration and the whole process seems absolutely seamless. My job is easy. I just bring things together, but the team are doing a fantastic job. So I want to say thank you to all of you and to all the participants, wherever you are, I hope you are keeping safe, and those who are following us on YouTube as well. Take care. Wherever you are, take care. God bless. Thank you very much.